Well, good afternoon. I mean, what an amazing day. So what I hope to achieve today is to tell you a story about a journey. And this is a journey that, it's my personal journey, and one that I've been on for 12 or more years. And it's a journey that continues to every single day of my life, excite me and motivate me and challenge me. And I hope by telling you this journey, about this journey, that it'll do what it does to me, is it changes my outlook on life. So I am a chemical engineer, and I'm one of those engineers that actually sees the glass half full. <laughs> Not like civil engineers, but I'll get in trouble for that. <laughs> and I started life out, I guess, uh, designing petrochemical uh, refineries, just like the one seen here in the picture. And these are the refineries that break up crude oil and make all of, of course, the fuels and the resources that we use to support our society today. And it requires one to understand how all of the small parts can come together to meet together and make a large system work. So around 12 years ago, I decided to apply my knowledge and my understanding in engineering processes and understanding impo the importance of single components within large multi-component systems to instead of engineering petrochemical plants, to engineering and designing human tissues. Now, I can already see people in the audience going, well, yeah, that's a little bit of a stretch, mate, because really, <laughs> petrochemical plants, human body, what are the similarities? Well, like a good engineer as I am, I see everything from an engineering perspective. And I see them both as extremely complex systems, systems that are made up of a multitude of processes, processes that must interact with each other, and processes that rely on many small parts coming together in order to make that whole system work to achieve a particular function. So as an example, if I want to pump crude oil from one process unit, for example, a tank, to a distillation column like shown in the picture here, then I'll use a multitude of pumps. And in order to get it from the pump to the t from the tank through the pump to the distillation column, I'll use a complex network of pipework. And you can see that complex network here. Well, your body's no different, in fact. What you have in your body, of course, not a multitude of pumps, but one pump. That's your heart. And that pumps blood to all of your tissues and supplies oxygen to all of your tissues to keep them alive. And it does that through a complex network of pipes. They're your blood vessels. And the similarities don't stop here, because in a refinery, if all those pumps stop at once, then your refinery comes to a grinding halt. Well, your body's the same. All of your functional units, your brain, your major vital organs, all of your tissues will come to a grinding halt if your pump stops, if your heart fails. So the system I'm talking about today is called the cardiovascular system. And you can see that the heart sits at the center of the cardiovascular system. And cardiovascular diseases are responsible for more deaths in Australia than any other disease every year, accounting for 31% of all deaths in Australia every year. 3.4 million Australians are suffering from cardiovascular diseases of one type or another every day. And it's responsible for the highest level of hospitalisation for people over the age of 65. Now, of that 31% of deaths, in fact, half of them, 15%, are due to one particular cardiovascular disease called ischemic heart disease. And this is actually responsible for more deaths in all industrialized nations across the globe than any other disease. Ischemic heart disease, in the majority of cases, is actually the result of an acute event, or the start of ischemic heart disease is the result of an acute event. And most of us know what that would be. Unfortunately, that acute event is a heart attack. So what happens when the pump fails? Well, a heart attack is when, in fact, an artery that's supplying the majority of blood to a particular part of your heart gets blocked. And whilst from a massive heart attack it could be fatal, in the majority of cases we survive. But that tissue that was blocked from that vital blood supply dies. Now unfortunately, unlike some other tissues in our body, like our liver, that is very good at regenerating itself, and thank goodness for that, 
Heart tissue, unfortunately, is not good at regenerating itself. It's very poor. So what happens is instead of that area of heart tissue that has died after the blockage being replaced with heart tissue, it's replaced with scar tissue. And scar tissue can't do what heart tissue does, it can't beat. So what your heart does, because it's still got to pump blood around your body, is it keeps working, and it keeps working harder and harder and harder. And just like any muscle that has been exercised and overworked, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And eventually, it fails. Heart failure. An unfortunate statistic is that over 50% of people who suffer a heart attack will die within five years. Now, this is where my story becomes very personal. Because in the last seven years, three members of my family have had a heart attack. And chronic heart failure is the end for all of them. One of them was given less than five years to live. And that was four years ago. So what if we could change this? What if we could repair or replace that damaged dead tissue? What if we could make heart failure a thing of the past? Well, that's exactly our aim. So how are we going to do that? Well, we, along with other groups around the world, are investigating the opportunity to, in fact, engineer our own heart tissue. To tissue engineer, to make tissue engineered myocardium. To replace that myocardium that you've lost. But you should understand from an engineering perspective, in order to engineer anything, you've got to understand all of the parts and how all of the parts come together to make a system. So all cells within tissues sit within what's called a tissue niche, or a tissue microenvironment. And it's a supportive environment made up of the cells that are normally functional, and then the cells that are supportive, and then proteins. And in the heart tissue niche, which is shown up here in these images, what you have are two specialist types of cells. One's called a cardiomyocyte, and that's the one that beats. And the other cell, a cardiac fibroblast, is the supportive cell. And these form highly integrated, structured, organized tissues. But what's important to understand is, in fact, this tissue niche is extremely small. It's around two to 300 microns in size. To give you an appreciation of how big that is, here's a picture of a human hair. It's around 50 to 70 microns across. So get four of your hairs off your head, should you still have them, put them together, and that's the size of the tissue niche that we're trying to replicate. But I don't just have to make one of them. I have to make hundreds of thousands of them. And I have to put them together to make a tissue. What's also important to understand is that these cells, these two cyber cells, are not randomly oriented. They're oriented in defined strips, in fact, alternating strips, that are about one or two cells wide. And they're not just separate from each other. They're, in fact, connected long on. So just as if everyone in each of these rows, in fact, you look like a bit of myocardium to me if you joined hands. <laughs> If everyone joined hands in this row, then you would be the strips of different cells, the cardio, uh, fibroblasts and the cardiomyocytes, but you would actually be connected between rows as well at points. So they're communicating with each other, and they have to, because in order for the tissue to beat, a flux of calcium, a wave of calcium, has to go from one cell here, so from that end of the row, right across to the other end of the row, in less than a second. And it has to go through the cell bodies. So they have to be intimately connected. Now, another complicating factor is that these lines of cells are not just by themselves. In fact, they are supported by proteins, specialist proteins, which allow these cells to communicate with each other even though they're not physically touching. And this is called the extracellular matrix. I want to dig a little bit deeper in there just to show you how complicated this can get in the fact the extracellular matrix, each individual molecule there, is 50 nanometers big. That's one one-thousandth of the thickness of your hair. And this, three this extracellular matrix is a three-dimensional environment. So it's just like casting a three-dimensional fishing net over all of you, and if somebody up the top happened to pull on it, somebody down here would feel it. So these cells are communicating with each other across three dimensions. And what this allows the cells to do is to touch and to smell and to taste. So just like 
we would pull on the net and feel it and how stiff or strong it was, cells do exactly the same thing. So they pull on this net, this extracellular matrix, and they go, oh, that feels like bone, or oh, that feels like fat, or oh, no, that's just right, heart muscle. And then they interact with individual proteins, and depending on which protein in that matrix they interact with, they can choose, or they will be directed, in fact, to move, or to grow, or to even potentially die. And then these cells in between each rows, just like each of the people in these rows, are communicating with each other through soluble factors. So they're secreting soluble factors, and cells in the next row are picking them up, and they respond to them. So this is obviously an incredibly complex, multi-component, multi-length scale environment that we're trying to recreate. Now how, in all manner of time, would we be able to recreate that outside of the body? So luckily, however, tissue engineers over the last 10 years or so have worked out that you don't actually have to mimic all of this complexity. You just have to mimic critical components of it. You have to motivate the cells in the right way, and you have to work out what those motivational signals and tools are, just like with children. If you have children, you can work out what pushes buttons. <laughs> so we need to provide to the cells the right cues. We don't need to provide of all of them, just the right ones, so that then they do what they do best, they make tissue. So by this logic, if we know enough about the heart tissue niche, and we can then work out what the minimum cues are that these cells require, and the right type of cells, then maybe, just maybe, we could make that tissue-engineered myocardium. Well, in fact, we've managed to do that, and what I'm showing you here is a heart patch. And it's a heart patch that's about two or three centimeters long, it's about a centimeter wide. It's actually made from rat cells. And what you'll notice is that it beats as one unit, just like your heart tissue does. And the graphical representation below actually shows you the regularity of that beat. And the figure further below that, which is the high frequency wave, actually shows what happens to this tissue when I give it a drug, that if I give to you, your heart rate will increase. If I give that drug to this tissue in a dish, it starts to beat faster too. And if I take the drug away, it slows down, just like your heart would. Now, of course, this is a heart patch made for a very small heart. In fact, it's made for a rat. And you can see here that heart patch sitting on a rat's heart, sewn to a rat's heart, beating with a rat's heart. Now, in order to make this happen, we had to engineer this system from bottom up. We actually had to make a completely new material that was matched to the mechanical properties of the heart. Because remember, cells feel. So they have to feel like, well, yeah, this is a heart. And they have to bind to the right matrix molecule, so we put that on top of the surface of this material. So now they feel as if they're in a heart, and I have to put the right cells in there as well. So I put cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts, but that's not good enough. I have to put them in the right ratio. And if I do that, and if I do all of that, so if I actually engineer this from nanometers up to centimeters, that's when I get a complete beating patch as one. Boom, 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 boom. If I don't do all of that, I don't get that. So I can already see people in the audience go, well, that's fantastic, mate, but really, who cares about rat hearts? Why aren't you working on human hearts? Why aren't you working on human heart tissue? Well, we are. But we're not as far with human heart tissue as we are with rat heart tissue. And one of the reasons for that was until a couple of years ago, we were having major problems getting the right cell type. That is, human heart cells. Because no matter how many people I asked, they just wouldn't give me any of their heart tissue. <laughs> Seriously, for the progress of science. So, and even if they did, it wouldn't work. Because mature adult cardiomyocytes don't proliferate. They don't grow. And in fact, that's the whole core of the problem. And I need about 100 million cells per cubic centimeter, so that's per sugar cube that you drop in your coffee, I need 100 million cells in there just to make the tissue. So where am I going to get human heart cells from when nobody's going to give me their heart tissue to make some more? I'm going to make it from your skin. Luckily, about five years ago, a gentleman by the name of Shinya Yamanaka actually discovered that if you get skin fibroblasts, 
which can just come from a simple biopsy of your skin, and you give them four particular factors, in fact, they're four genes, then you will induce those skin fibroblasts to turn into what are now known as induced pluripotent stem cells. And induced pluripotent stem cells are incredibly important to this picture because induced pluripotent stem cells can be then directed to turn into all tissues in your body, even cardiac tissue, even cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts. Now, this is a pretty amazing discovery, you'll have to admit, and for that, justifiably, he won a Nobel, Pro Nobel Prize last year. For you and me, what it means is that now your skin cells be can become your heart cells. Your skin cells can become, maybe, your heart tissue. And that's exactly what I'm showing you here. So I'm going to show you two videos. The one on the left-hand side, yeah, that's it, the one on the left-hand side, is actually our beating mass of human heart tissue. And you can see that it beats, in fact, just like a mini heart. It's made of human cardiomyocytes and human cardiac fibroblasts, all originally derived from human skin, from biopsies, from donors, just like you, you and me. And what you'll note is when it fades to black, there are green cells, and they're your cardiomyocytes and they're interlaced between this tissue, and they're connected, and they're even lined up in regions. And in between those, the cells you can't see, that's the fibroblasts. Now, importantly for function, what we also need to see is that wave of calcium coming across the heart tissue. And here you can see it, we've imaged now the calcium flux, going from one side to the other, continually pulsing, and that must happen, otherwise the heart tissue doesn't beat. So you can probably tell I'm pretty, very excited about these results. <laughs> and now we're starting to use these cells on new generation patches like I showed you before, and in injectable jelly-like materials that can actually be delivered to the site of injury of your heart, matched to the mechanical properties of human heart tissue, providing the minimum level of cues that those cells need to hopefully turn from immature cardiac cells like they are now to mature cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts in a structured heart tissue to replace your scar tissue. But that's not where it stops. Because now that I can get your skin cells and I can make your heart tissue in a dish, I can now pre-screen drugs. And many of the drugs we actually have for many treatments for cancer, in fact most of them, are cardiotoxic. They're bad for your heart. But with your heart tissue in a dish, I can now screen in the future those drugs and make sure that we personalize your treatment regime to make sure that whilst you're overcoming some other disease, whether it be cancer or another, we're not damaging your heart at the same time. So what I hope to convey to you today is the incredible potential and possibilities associated with personalized medicine and personalized regenerative therapies, not just for cardiovascular diseases and heart disease, but for all of your tissues and organs. The potential you can see here is absolutely phenomenal, and I fundamentally believe it will be the future of medicine. These fields are developing so fast, and it's such an exciting time to be in this field and to be alive, to tell you the truth. So what I hope to do today is a couple of things. One is to inspire you to think big and to dream bigger than your normal dreams. Because here's a reality check. If I had have told you five years ago, you know what, in five years' time, I'm going to be able to grab your skin cells, and I'm going to be able to put them in a dish, turn them into your heart cells, then I'm going to be able to make heart tissue, then I'm going to be able to screen drugs to make sure you don't get sick you know, when you're taking your cancer drugs, and then I'm going to make up a patch to repair your heart just in case you have a heart attack. You would have looked at me and went, yeah, right blank stares of disbelief. But now it's a reality. So dream big. And the closing statement that I'd like to say, I guess, is that we, I don't do this all myself, I have a fabulous team of PhD students, a fabulous team of postdocs, and a fabulous group of collaborators. And we together at the University of Queensland are truly passionate about making this dream come true about making heart failure a thing of the past. 
And I truly think that this will be possible with a lot more hard work, but it will be possible to mend a broken heart. Thank you for your time.